to the bottom line where we examine trending and important news. Chief Justice Roxanne George dismissed the case filed by opposition leader Aubrey Norton, challenging the appointment of the Police Service Commission chairman and members of the Integrity Commission by President Dr. Irfan Ali. Norton contended in his legal proceedings that the President did not comply with the Constitution nor the Integrity Commission Act. Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, City Council Anand Lau, broke down the ruling by the Chief Justice during his online program, Issues in the News. The leader of the opposition contends or contended that he was not meaningfully consulted in accordance with the Constitution or the Integrity uh, Commission Act. And of course, we had to file a defense to the case and we had to put forward our evidence in support of our defense. We contend that the president followed the letter and spirit of both the Constitution and the Integrity Commission Act in consulting with the leader of the opposition. We exhibited to the court a series of letters which were exchanged between Minister Gail Teixeira on behalf of His Excellency the President, yours truly on behalf of His Excellency the President, as well as letters that came in response from the leader of the opposition. We also detail the fact that the leader of the opposition attended an in-person meeting to discuss these consultations and also was invited to another meeting which he chose not to attend. The letters were examined carefully by the Chief Justice and those letters established clearly, firstly, that the President sent the names of the persons for the respective commissions with whom he wished to consult with. The Chief Justice lambasted the opposition leader for the manner in which he approached the consultation. Describing his conduct as uncooperative, identifying his conduct as not reciprocal, describing his conduct as not understanding his obligation in the consultative process, that the consultation process is not a one-way street, that it requires mutuality, it requires an input from both sides, that he failed to clarify what is this additional information he keeps asking for, that he did not furnish a single nominee of his own to counter the nominees put forward by the president, that he did not advance a single criticism during the negotiations or the consultations against any of the nominees of the president to suggest that they were unqualified or unsuitable. But after the consultation came to an end, and in the case itself, he starts to make up objections, and that was not countenanced and tolerated, and were rejected out of hand. And the Chief Justice spoke about the high responsibility that devolves both on the president and on the leader of the opposition when it comes to consultation. And that this consultative process must be engaged in in a civil manner. And that he, Mr. Norton, was more confrontational than civil. And that he brought in to the negotiations and to the consultations highly extraneous matters. The AG said this case demonstrates that Norton, as opposition leader, is incapable of discharging the high level of responsibility and duties of this important constitutional office. I have never seen the judicial branch make such scathing remarks regarding a high constitutional office holder like the leader of the opposition in the manner expressed 
in this judgment. This guy only wants to be confrontational and only wants a papi show so that he can exhibit himself to the press. And that is that is how, that is what characterizes all his public engagements. The PPPC administration since taking office has invested heavily to ensure every child has access to quality education. This year, every child attending public and private schools receives 30,000 as a part of the government's Because We Care and School Uniform and Supplies Grant. The Rotaract Club of Georgetown, supported by the recently launched President Youth Advisory Council, conducted a back-to-school drive at the Sophia Primary School. Students attending the Sophia Primary School and other schools around Georgetown are now equipped with the necessary supplies for the new school term. No matter what, no matter anything, no matter what you hear, no matter circumstances, always believe in yourself, okay? Always tell yourself that you can do it and practice makes perfect, all right? And with a bit of practice, with a bit of diligence and consistency, I know you all can be excellent young men and young women in society, and that is what we want. And a part of that is volunteerism. Go to your community and do some good works and bring other people up with you. The PYAC was established to ensure young people are integrally involved in the development of Guyana and operate efficiently at every level of national life. Will Johnson, former advisor on culture to the education minister, made an appearance on the Freddie Gilhari show where he spoke about being hired to create a framework cultural policy under the previous APNU plus AFC coalition government. Johnson said the framework policy was completed since February of 2017. For example, um, like one of the recommendations of the policy was to ensure that the Guyana Prize for Literature was uh, reformed and brought into line with, say, like the Bocas Lit Festival. What we had was not just a, 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 the lack of reformation of the Guyana Prize, but its complete removal. Um, so in 2017, there was a call for, this was the only call for um, entries for the Guyana Prize for Literature under the Granger administration. Um, and the Guyana, Guyana Prize Committee gave, made, made, gave the call. People actually submitted entries for that, for that prize. 2017 came and went, 2018 came and went, and up to now nobody can say definitively what happened to the prize that year or subsequently. Noting that the Guyana Prize for Literature was brought back on the current PPPC administration, Johnson added that he could not see any political characteristics that would cause the former APNU plus CFC government to act in such a manner. Because it was started by Desmond Height in 1987, and it continued, albeit unevenly, um, within a certain space in 2006 to 2011. Um, but then it was brought back 2011, 2013, 2015. It was to be in 2017, but it was completely removed. And it was up to now, I cannot, um, I don't have an answer um, to why it was removed completely. So by 2019, it was clear to me that um, the, there, wasn't, there was no real intention to either put in place the policy as a whole or to take seriously the derivative recommendations coming out of it. Johnson went on to talk about the Creative Industry Cash Grant that was created in 2017 by the former APN plus CFC coalition government and the haphazard manner in which it was handled. It was haphazardly implemented I think in either 2018 or 2019 with absolutely zero transparency. Um, so you don't know who received it, to what amount, um, and what the total thing. I think they had about 20 million that was allocated to it. 
and there was no accountability in who received what? Up to now. Um, when, and this, this was it, it had been implemented about two years after the initial concept. So where that 20 million went to? Uh? Um, <laughs> I, can, I can say this. <laughs> anecdotally, <laughs> anecdotally, um, it's, it, anecdotally, I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I received uh, this, this, this thing. But again, there was no, and this is not to say that the people who deserved it, who, who got it, didn't deserve it. It's just we have no transparency with regard to who received it, under what conditions, under what judge, um, um, under what judgment or criteria. Guyana's creative industry was deprived of millions in funding during the five years of the coalition. This is according to Johnson, who said Guyana lacked proper representation at international fora. A Guyanese creative people. Um, and I can say this now, lost out on millions of dollars simply because government at the time just refused to ensure that we had a representation at international fora, which were paid, paid for by the people, by the way. Mm -hmm. Paid for by the people hosting the forum. And they just said, no, we're not interested. Kisun pressed Johnson on whether he thought the opposition to the policy came from the then Minister of State, Joseph Harmon, or former President, David Granger. The policy that I know I remember I personally ensured that every single minister of government got a copy for, copy of. And when I asked about, and this, this is from everybody from Nagamutu to Rupnarang to him, there, 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 was a, there was sort of a black hole with regard to what was not being said with regard to how it, how it did not move on or, or, not, or moved on. And it did not move on. You're not known to be a diplomat, so no, no, I'm, I'm not, I, I am I, going to push you out of your diplomacy. No, no, but, but, no, but I'm, I'm... You look like you're talking about going to jail. No, but I, I, the, the, the inference, I'm, I, I, like, I like accuracy in what I say. So I can't definitively say it was from Granger, but... If it is that the Prime Minister, because I remember going to Nagamutu and saying, this thing's finished. And remember, we would have qualified for um, something called the International Fund for Cultural Diversity. And I remember from U UNDP, for UNESCO, sorry. And the I given the, the initial draft in, say, February of 2017. The... In March 2017 was the deadline for application. Um, March came and went, and between and when I applied to UNESCO and got an extension to June. And in the interim, I spoke to everybody, and I said, "This thing is critical. We put this thing forward. The country can benefit from this thing." I went to Nagmutu. No, and and at the time, I believe. Uh, Nicholas Henry. I was asked to produce a, was it a state paper on it? Okay, I give the state paper. But then I asked to produce a green paper on it. <laughs> I produced a green paper. Then I was asked to produce a white paper on it. Produce the white paper. At the end of the day. But you're multi ethnic, so you're happy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, so I can't definitively say, but there was enough inference that. The refusal to move forward in it came from one central space. Johnson contrasts the framework cultural policy document to the removed Walter Rodney sign at the National Archives. Nobody knew exactly where the order came from, but the inference was clear. While noting there is always space for a third force in Guyana's political arena, host and political activist Freddie Kassoon Question former executive member of A New and United Guyana, Jonathan Yearwood, on his exit from that party. If there is if there is one thing I can hold my head up high on, is my integrity. My integrity is not up for sale. So I know was supposed to have an election in twenty twenty annual election in 2020. That was put off because of the recount. Yeah. It was supposed to be in, I think it was in April 2020, 
and the turmoil from the general election was still continuing at that point in time. So it was put off. President Ali was sworn in on the 2nd of August 2020. And Im almost immediately after, I started pushing for ANUG to have an annual general meeting because our time as leadership had passed. Mm. Let's have a new mandate. We had new members come in by then. Let us have a new mandate, whatever. I tried in September. I tried in October. I tried in December. I tried in January. Nobody except one other person was interested. Nobody on the executive. Anong's executive consists of names like former speaker Rafael Rankaran, Timothy Jonas, a prominent attorney, and Keonj Boer. I, I will say that the only person that showed any interest was, that was Mark Fox. Yes. Let's leave it at that. I was told point blank. When I took this up, when I took this up, I was told point blank. You want to do an election, you do it yourself. Not the executive will do it. Not the executive will do it. You do it yourself. So I took it upon myself to do it. After seeking advice, Yearwood said he found a software called Election Run. This would have allowed the party to host internal elections during the COVID-19 period. Yearwood said he also did a trial run with the executive and the system worked perfectly. So I was told that, look, I have to do the election. So I organized it. I got all, whichever members we had, I got the, all the email addresses. I did the election runner. And all I had to do, I even named the dates. The date we would have the, the vote for the change of the constitution and the date that we would have the vote for the new executive. Already sorted out. All I need is the executive to say, go. That go never came. When I kept pressing and I kept pressing and I kept pressing, it never came. So I decided at that point in time, y'all are not interested in changing this executive. What am I doing here? I'm not going to function under any means in which I don't have a mandate. I don't have a mandate. My mandate ended April whenever 2020. So I am now into 2021. This is what? Two years over the mandate? Okay, we could understand. Uh, a year plus, we could understand because of the 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 the, the uh, recounts and the election fiasco we could understand that but we finished all of that on the 2nd of august 2020 new president was sworn in on 20, 2020 let us get our house in order after some time you would said a date was set however there was a twist but against the annual constitution so so my argument was, how can you have nominations for a political position at the time of at the, the election? time of the election? That's an absurdity. Of course, it is. when your when your constitution says specifically, it names seven days, yeah. and then in two other places it says, given enough time, nominations must be done with enough time before the election. But Prop only once it named, it was named at seven days. Perhaps this. Given enough time, have a but logically, a loose interpretation. Well, that's what that that's what it worked out to be. A very <laughs> loose, loose interpretation. Right? It was at this point he would said he felt it was time to leave. Talks between the coalition partners APNU and AFC over the selection of a candidate to fill the post of vice chair in Region Ten reached a stalemate as the PNC APNU has rejected the AFC's pick. Coretta Braffitt. The PNC APNU is insisting that whomever the AFC chooses must have its support, which in effect would result in the PNC APNU deciding who should be the AFC's candidate to replace the APNU's Douglas Gittings, who died of COVID-19 in June of 2021. The issue was not whether it's an AFC vice chairman. As far as I know, the, the APNU has been disposed to uh, AFC vice chair, but it must not be somebody that is dictated by the AFC who doesn't have the confidence of the APNU since they have to work together. In fact, if they want to be honest, there is an AFC name that there is reasonable agreement on that could move forward. 
Although Norton refused to divulge a name in question, sources have indicated that Mark Goring is the person the PNC-APNU prefers. And that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm.